What if I told you that almost everything we know about ourselves and our behavior is fundamentally wrong? Just notice how humanity has progressed since the scientific revolution in the fields of medicine, engineering, physics and everything that allows us to create a technology thanks to which you have a device with a small screen connected to the Wi-Fi with which you manage to watch videos of Belle Dolphin at night under the blanket. You little simp. But at the same time we are so lagging in research and understanding human behavior that to this day the field of psychology has hardly changed since ancient Greece. Notice that in biology, chemistry and physics there are precise research methods, experiments and thriving technologies. But on the other hand, the fields of psychology and sociology are not considered natural sciences at all. Psychology is experiencing a replication crisis. This means its studies can hardly replicate similar results by different investigators. And if people go to a psychologist for help, they usually talk about nothing and extract money from the client. So if you have depression or anxiety, watching Andrew Tate videos is much better. This is the state of modern psychology. But is everything really that bad? Maybe it isn't possible at all to study human behavior scientifically. Perhaps everything we do is because of our desire that spontaneously changes all the time. So let me tell you, all is not lost. We can use the same methods of natural sciences to investigate the causes of human behavior. I know it may sound boring, but guys, you must watch this this video until the end. It's possible to create a precise science that will allow us to understand how to overcome social anxiety and finally hit on Stacy from the parallel class, how to predict the next topic that Elon Musk will tweet about and maybe how to solve the complex social problems that overwhelm us such as crime, wars, etc. But the most crucial question is, if such a new science emerges, will we be able to cope with the discoveries that such a science will provide us about ourselves? So guys, Prepare well, because now we are about to dive into the depths of human nature and understand the fascinating thing in the world, why we do what we do. Listen to this. Give me a dozen healthy infants, well formed and my own specified world to bring them up in and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train them to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief and yes, even beggar man and thief regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocabulary and race of his ancestors. This candle's quote belongs to the last century psychologist John B. Watson. Of course, we can understand Watson's enormous emphasis on the external environment's influence on the individual's behavior. At the time, Watson's approach caused quite a stir and even today the hypothesis that the environment influences everything we do is controversial. But what if I told you that this approach has countless experimental evidence? What if I told you that a science of behavior is entirely possible and already exist. Are you intrigued? Excellent. So meet the most controversial approach in psychology, behaviorism. So basically, we can understand the behaviorist approach in two main points. One, natural science like biology, physics, chemistry and astronomy about our behavior and feelings is entirely possible. Two, most common explanations of behavior today are fiction. Man acts according to emotion. Fiction. Consciousness is what drives us, also bullshit. Even the concept of behavior isn't clearly defined. We don't even know what's more important to study, the behavior or the emotions. Let's take an example from everyday life and see how we explain behavior using everyday language. So you're hanging out with a friend at the bar and suddenly he notices a beautiful girl. Go hit on her brody, you encourage your friend, but even the thought of approaching her scares him. You see hesitation, some deep concentration on his face and he doesn't approach her. Oh brody just a shy guy. When you use the word shy, you were actually trying to explain your friend's behavior. You saw external behavior, he can approach some girl and you explained it as shyness, but you infer this shyness from the external behavior itself. So Brody doesn't approach the girl because he's shy. That's the same if you say Brody is shy because he doesn't approach a girl. But why is he shy? Why is he nervous? We create a useless, circular explanation and our common sense investigation of the causes of behavior stops there. Let's take another interesting example. Not long ago I came across a post where a girl wrote that her boyfriend slapped her for the first time. She said it happened in a heat of the moment and tried to justify her boyfriend. But many of us were in arguments and chatting with our girlfriends also in the heat of the moment but we didn't react like that. 
so apparently emotion is not the cause of the behavior, but what is, we don't know. All of our information and perceptions about human behavior are limited to imaginary and useless explanations. This person shuts all the time because he isn't angry, the criminal commits a crime due to personality problems, the serial killer pulls the trigger due to an impulse, etc. We try to explain actions using imaginary internal entities such as feelings, thoughts, desires, will, but fail to find an explanation for those entities, that is we don't really know why we behave the way we do. The behaviorists notice all these errors and realize that to understand our behavior truly, we must stop with the old philosophies, theories and traditional opinions and start using the most effective tool for exploring nature, the scientific method, and that's how it began, the red pill of psychology. It was already known that the consequences of actions affect the actions themselves. We reward or punish people if they behave in a certain way. For example, when you talk with some girl and as soon as you try to set up a date, she starts making excuses, then you start to ignore her. If she agrees to meet, you keep talking to her. So the first to discover that there is order in behavior and to study it experimentally was Edward Thorndike, a psychologist from the 19th century. He studied how long it takes the cats to get out of a particular experimental box and saw that the amount of time needed to get out got shorter with each try. He created this graph and called it the learning curve. Later, Ivan Pavlov and John B. Watson, by the way, the first avowed behaviorist, studied the phenomenon of classical conditioning. In well-known experiments, Pavlov studied salivation behavior in dogs and Watson studied fear behavior in babies. In Watson's experiments, he discovered that the particular part of our fears was created during our lifetime through classical conditioning. But the most severe discoveries that revolutionized the field of psychology came in the 40s when B. F. Skinner published his first book, The Behavior of Organisms, in which he described the studies of operant conditioning. Skinner described for the first time precisely how behavior is directly affected by its consequences. He put hungry rats in special experimental boxes with a pedal that if pressed they get food. Spontaneously at some point the rat pressed the pedal and got food. Later the rat started pushing more and more. Skinner measured the frequency of the pressing behavior and noticed that the frequency increased significantly when that behavior led to food. Skinner later disconnected the device so that the behavior of pressing the pedal no longer led to food. He discovered that over time the red pressed less and less, which proved that the food as an environmental consequence was the stimuli that was the cause of the behavior. Later he examined the same order of operant behavior with water and studied how stimuli such as intense light and electric shocks weakened the frequency of the behavior, thus showing that there is a direct relationship between external behavior and environmental events. Later those experiments of operant behavior were tried on another animals and it became clear that the order of operant conditioning exists in all developed animals, including humans. In 1953, Skinner published his book Science and Human Behavior, where he used this new type of analysis and explained many human behaviors. In this way, Skinner was able to create a new behavioral science. He developed a unit of measurement, described environmental role in influencing behavior, presented accurate graphs, and called this science the experimental analysis of behavior. But all doubts regarding operant conditioning with humans disappear when the field of applied behavioral analysis was created. This therapeutic field bases its treatment methods on classical and operant conditioning and helps people solve behavioral problems. Today there are tens of thousands of articles in the field, problem solving cases, official organizations and academic journals. So let's talk a moment about the new view that behaviorism gives us about behavior. The basic premise of behaviorism is that the environment shapes behavior. Yes, yeah, since we are born we are acting upon the world and the consequences to which the actions lead shape our behavior and personality. If we take a guy who fails to approach girls because of fear or because of shyness, we can say that in the past when he was placed in social situations that required him to take some initiative, it led to ridicule or laughs from his friends and it affects him. Usually when we receive social punishment, the corresponding emotions are embarrassment and anxiety. In everyday language, it is accepted to separate the emotion from from the behavior and thus try to explain one by the other. Behaviorism claims that it's impossible to separate emotions and behavior. Here is another critical example of how a behavioristic scientific explanation has led us to refute useless mentalistic explanation. In 1917, Wolfgang Kohler, a great psychologist and one of the prominent representatives of Gestalt approach in psychology, examined the behavior of 
chips to investigate our intelligence and learning abilities. <laughs> Fiction concepts. They were in cage and he set them different tasks. One of the tasks was to reach a banana hanging in a high place in the cage that the chimps couldn't get by jumping. What I need to do is to move some boxes that were in the cage and climp on them. To Kohler's surprise, after long and patient observations of the chimps, they managed to do it. Kohler tried to explain the behavior of the chimpanzees using the concept of an imagined explanation that he called insight. Enlightenment or immediate understanding of the connection between the problem and its solution. Okay, where did this insight come from? Can the chimpanzee solve other types of problems that are not related to moving boxes and catching bananas? Unknown. But in the 60s, B.F. Skinner and his colleague Robert Epstein reproduced similar experiments with pigeons. They took a pigeon and placed it in an experimental box with a similar task. There was a fake banana hanging from the ceiling. The only way for the pigeon to reach it was to move a small box toward the banana and climb on it. The goal was to tap the banana with the beak. The pigeon's wings were tight so that it couldn't fly. In addition, inside the experimental box was an actual food dispenser. So what Skinner and Epstein did was the following. First, they let the pigeon tap the banana while hanging low and reinforce it with food from the food dispenser. Later, they hanged the banana up high and aided the box. They reinforced the pigeon every time it came near the box. After that, they gradually reinforced the pigeon if it had silently moved the box towards the banana. And after that, they reinforced behaviors of jumping on the box and so on. So after this training program, they they placed the pigeon in the experimental box with the little box set away from the banana. And they saw that the pigeon itself moved the box toward the banana, climbed on it and touched it. In this case, when we see which actions of the pigeon led to reinforce the consequences, the actual food and the entire sequence of training that shaped this complex behavior repertoire in this specific environment, mental explanations like insight are no longer relevant. Wolfgang Kohler had no idea about the behavior history of the chimps he was observing. They may have had a long history of moving things, jumping, etc. So, if you have noticed, the discoveries of the new behavioral science give us further, non-obvious information about how we act and contradict all the traditional views accepted in society. Of course, all of this puts us in front of difficult questions about free will, responsibility and so on. But behavior analysis isn't the only scientific field that dismisses the idea of free will. In this book, Sam Harris shows that some devices that monitor our brain activity can tell us how a person will react a few seconds before he reacts. There is a saying that we believe in free will because we know our behavior, not its causes. Analyzing behavior under precise laboratory conditions helps us to interpolate the complex behavior of man in everyday life as astronomers try to interpolate space with the help of physics and other laboratory sciences. Beyond these theoretical discussions, behaviorism promises us a thriving technology of behavior that can enable us to solve individual and social problems. In this video, I described how I solved my approach and anxiety with the help of behavioral methods. So guys, I hope you liked the video and learned something new. Don't forget to subscribe and help this channel grow. See you in the next time.